Right, good afternoon, guys. I'm going to come over here. Can you hear me? I hear the acoustics not so good in here, so I wanted to make sure everybody could hear me. As, I, as you heard, I've been in industry uh, December 45 years, and uh, actually, when I, I've been working in, uh, in SDN and NFB with some of the guys that started all of this. In fact, the team that started and wrote the first paper called NFB were my old team in BT, and I worked with them actually as part of Etsy, so I'm talking from... Uh, from some experience here about these topics. So I, I'd love to share with you the excitement and the perspective that I, I have and, and see if you're as excited as I am. Because I know there's so much hype here, it's hard to separate the wood from the wood. Yeah? Um, so I wanted to really, I wanted to level set us here. We've all heard all these words, SDN and NFB, and we've all got a Let's try and get a level set about what these things are, and I'll give you my view of them, right? So in, in simple terms, because I'm a simple guy, uh, you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it. SDN is the brains of the network. Think about it like the brains, you know? And uh, a brain is a centralized intelligence. One of the, uh, the, the, the ways you can recognize an SDN network is some kind of centralization of intelligence. It doesn't mean a single centralization, because we all know about single points of failure, but it means we've got a more centralized intelligence, okay? So that's one of the things that's important. Um, I also want to share with you uh, another way, when we, when we want to classify a network as SDN as opposed to anything else, so we begin to understand what this SDN actually means. Uh, if you look at a piece of networking equipment, Ethernet switch, I'm sure you've seen one of those, anything like that, any piece of network equipment, then inside it, you've got these kind of four different processes going on. You've got something that's actually sending packets from one place to another. That's called forwarding, a forwarding plane. Uh, something that's deciding where those packets go, the control plane. Okay, we're up to now? Good. Something that is maybe higher level services, like a firewall, doing some kind of function, intelligently doing something to those packets. The services plane. And then the management plane. So we've got some sort of management system that is watching what's going on, right? Monitoring it, controlling it, all the rest of it. The important definitions, and today, the f what we see is that they're currently embedded in, in a box. Yeah? And what SDN is going to do, it's going to blow that all apart. So as well as having the centralized intelligence, it starts to blow all this stuff apart from, I'm going to point at it, but from what? From the old world of it all being embedded and together to these things being separate. And there's some big advantages and some sort of disadvantages in doing that, but it really changes things when we start to do that, right? So we separate the control planes. And just to give you a bit more color on that, what we actually do is, when you're looking at forwarding, that's, you know, moving packets from one place to another. Logically, that needs to be local. You know, we're sitting here in Birmingham. It's no good if you tell me I've got to put my cable in in Manchester. All right? Common sense, right? When you're looking at control, well, you don't want everything to be done. I'll talk about open flow in a minute. You don't want everything to be done in the centralized intelligence. Otherwise, every time you want to route a packet, you go back to the brain in London. No. We like some regional devolution, don't we? You know? Right? We don't want everything done in London. It might not be a good idea. Or worse, in Brussels, yeah? and the latency of those sort of decisions. So when we look at the, contr at the control plane, what we actually do is we have some centralized intelligence. We have some intelligence locally, and that's called pipelining. The ability to maybe decide where flow is going. Once we've decided, the control plane locally can get on with it in the future when other packets come. But we centralize services, and we centralize management. Now... Uh, just about four weeks ago, I, I, I had this wonderful opportunity in my life that I can go to the U.S. and meet these incredible people who are working in this world of NFB and SDN. And there's a guy called Mick McCowan. I don't know if it means anything to you, to you guys. But this was a, was a great professor. I would love to have been in his course at Stanford University. He said to his students one day, we've got a clean slate. If you could throw away everything you know about networking and start again, what would you do? And those students did something, as they do. And what they did, they did was to connect an Ethernet switch to a PC and say, let's stop this switch from doing what it normally does, forwarding packets. We'll, we'll write some software on this PC and we'll start deciding that, that we can do things differently, we can move the packets differently. And when they connected the PC and the, and the, and the switch together, they thought, well, let's have a name for this thing that controls where packets go, the flow of packets. Why don't we call it open flow? And that's where this open flow you hear about, if you've heard about SDN, it'll be one of the synonymous buzzwords that you hear about it. Our switches support open flow. This is where it began. 
It began with some clever guys at a university, like you, you're the, the guys you support, thinking about doing things differently. And um, so from that, Nick went out and uh, he's, you know, he thought, just like you do, we want to commercialize this and make some money out of it. So we'll set up this organization, or, and he was one of the founders, of something called the ONF, the Open Networking Foundation. And they started industrializing this protocol, 1.0 and 1.1 and all different versions of that protocol that came. And when he did that, we in Brocade joined from some of the very earliest days. You'll hear a number of people talk about openness today. I'm sure you have. And you will certainly hear it as you speak to different vendors in the industry. But openness doesn't mean just saying that you're open. Openness means being part of a community and working openly with that community to take this forward. And we've been key in doing that. In many of these organizations, we're one of the key contributors of code to these developments, one of the top contributors of code. And that's why in some of them, we're now chairing the whole organization, because people are respecting our contribution to the industry. We believe it's fantastic for us, fantastic for the industry. You can see some of the areas where we contributed here to OpenFlow. And OpenFlow is one of the key um, technologies that allows us to build networks with much greater flexibility. And, I, and remember, we're talking about SDN, and I defined it as a centralized intelligence of the breaking part of the planes. Okay? Now, along came NFV. Actually, the guys that thought of NFV were chatting with me about it probably about seven years before. I remember discussing it with one of the guys called Murray Cook, who went to be one of the leading lights in Intel, that was one of the inspirational people behind it. And we were talking about the fact that there's all this vendor equipment there, and it's all different all different manufacturers and different things, and you've got to plug it all together. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could have standardized x86 hardware and do it all in software? You know, we could move this world to a new place. And so uh, a great guy called Don Clark, who I know well, and the team, another guy called Pete Willis, they went out around uh, the industry, got a load of telcos together, and wrote this paper. You know it's engineers when they call it network functions virtualization. It's not really a marketing word, is it? You know? And, and they wrote this paper, and it led on to this whole idea. And in, in NFV, what we're really talking about is we're talking about taking routers and firewalls and network equipment and using the same techniques that we've used in the IT industry for many years of virtualization to build pools of resources. So now you can have pools of firewalls, you can have pools of routers, as well as pools of memory and pools of compute. And you can dynamically create these things in your data center. So instead of somebody going with cables and plugging them in, <coughs> you can just create one over there. And, and then wipe it out again and use the resource for something else a few minutes later. Or you can, you can create a whole overlay infrastructure. You can create a whole mobile core. So let me tell you a little bit about how it works. And I, I've reduced it down. I'd love you to give me an hour here. I could have given you the details of this properly. But I'm going to give you the kind of NFB in a, about two or three minutes. Okay. So, uh, so I've worked with Etsy since it began. Uh, I was part of the SWA. I've got a lot of contributions to the group specification I did personally, so I can talk from some experience here. Um, and this is the Etsy architecture. If you've not seen it, this, art, this picture is sort of in every sort of book or bid that I see or request from a big telco for, for some sort of NFV. It's always got this picture in it, right? And there were three fundamental parts to the architecture of NFV, right? A virtualized infrastructure, you can see that at the bottom. But NFV's invented all these buzzwords, and that's quite often called NFVI, right? The NFV infrastructure. And then some sort of orchestration that runs across that infrastructure, um, which you see over there. And then the virtualized functions that sit on top. So I'll, I'll, I'll explain very, very quickly how it works, okay? So what happens is that a, you receive a package, that's a software package from a vendor, like Brocade, and that package will have in it the, the information about the virtual machines, the memory that's needed, and the images that are going to form this particular function. And then there will be a wiring diagram as well of how you connect this all together, and that's called the service graph. All of that stuff is in, on, onboarded into a catalog. And then in simple terms, when you want to deploy it, the orchestrator extracts the recipe, which is that information from the catalog. It goes to the infrastructure, requests the resources, and then it builds the function. And when it's built it and it connects it all together, it boots the whole thing up, and it's just equivalent to you plugging into the mains a box. And when you plug into the mains a, com uh, a communications equipment today, it tends to automatically find a management system, 
and it downloads a configuration in, and it's up and going. There's a lot more to it than that. There's a lot of wonderful things about scalability, horizontal, vertical, in and out. Lots of things about resiliency and things about the question you asked earlier on about uh, chains of trust and how we're going to actually ensure control in different autonomous systems. And I'm happy to take offline that in detail because I can tell you some of the work that was there. I've had a 200-page report on that the other week. 200 pages on autonomous systems. So you, it kept me awake at night. Um, but I want to show one other slide here, which is um, a little bit about Brocade and its strategy. This is a slide not from Brocade, but from IDC. And it talks about the evolution of computing. Now, I started, I was talking to some of your colleagues out there over coffee. I started in the Xero platform. When, you know, we had it, when I was at university, we only had slide rules. We had log books. We never had a calculator. We had punch cards and paper tape. I don't know if you remember this world. But I was down there, you know. Uh, and then we come along, you know, came these mainframes and access to the mainframes when I got to university and thousands of apps. We moved up to the world of LANs. I lived through multi-protocol routing. I told you, 45 years in the industry nearly. I've lived through all of this stuff. It's been my life. And uh, client server and all of that stuff. And now we're in this world of the cloud, aren't we? And everybody's outsourcing business processes, going to the cloud. We're in shadow IT. We're in social networking, big data. This is called the third platform. And the, our belief and the industry's belief is to support this third platform, you need to have a new kind of network. It's no good to have the networks of the past. For us, that's the opportunity for our company, Brocade, to step out and be a leader in this new world. We can become, and that's our vision, the leader in the new world. And we call this new world the new IP beyond the old networks and the restrictions and the proprietary nature of these locked-in boxes and into a world of openness. And in this new world that I talked about, open means being a community. It means rapid innovation. It doesn't take years to build services, years or hours to connect firewalls up, climbing over racks with cables. It's all done in software. New services can be done in, in seconds rather than years. I mean, it's a completely new world. And this take talks to another evolution that's happening. The world, you've seen this with, with people bringing your own devices and, 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 and organizations within universities and within companies saying, I'm not happy with just the IT department. If they can't meet my needs, I'm going to go out to the cloud. I'm going to get it somewhere else. I want this, and you need to deliver it for me. We're moving to a world that's far more user-centric, you, you know, the user requirements of the world. That's my daughter about that. She'll tell you a thing or two. And software defined, of course. This is the world that we're moving to. I hope that gives you a view of what our kind of... I'll show you the implications in networks in a minute. And uh, I'm conscious for time. Five minutes. I got it. So we have a, a strategy. We call this the new IP framework. It runs down from orchestration. Where we support uh, OpenStack. I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. Um, we're, we've just released a controller, a network controller, a new completely open control and management framework which is built on industry standards with, our, with, with a whole number of vendors across the industry that we've been leading and contributing to. We have our own virtualized routers and, and a firewall and load balancers. And, of course, we have some fantastic network infrastructure that this whole thing runs on. So let me talk a little bit about OpenStack. OpenStack is about orchestration, right? Orchestration, the music of moving networks around, the music of this network, right? And what this means is that if you create a workload in your infrastructure, what's a workload? Well, today a workload has compute, it has storage in it, it has a network, it's something in your network. And you want to move that out to the cloud, to cloud burst it, or to decide that you no longer want to have it in your infrastructure, but to run it in the cloud somewhere. Well, in order to do that, there are standards that are needed to do that, because otherwise you have to rewrite that workload all the time to meet the requirements of the cloud provider that you're providing it to or different cloud providers. OpenStack allows you to harmonize all of that when you move workloads, and you can move compute, network, and storage resources. And we've been working as a key contributor to that as well since the earliest days. You can see some of the things that we've been doing. There's, there's 15,000 participants, and we're a leading, we're a leading uh, company in doing that. This is a simple diagram that just shows, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're moving workloads without OpenStack, <coughs> the issues, and moving it with. And, of course, with the whole move to the cloud, how important is OpenStack to you? Very important. 
And it's an open way of doing it as opposed to a proprietary way. There are other things out there, VMware can do this, but you're doing it in the VMware in the VMware way. This is an industry way. It's not a brocade way, it's an industry way. Now, here's a commitment to openness. How many of Brocade's products today support OpenStack? All right? All of them. All right? We've written uh, software, we're keeping it up to date. It's a big commitment for our company to do this, to build all of the plugins to the OpenStack system for the equipment that we've got today that we make, and that's just our range of products that we've got. Now, just a few weeks ago, I'm conscious of time, just a few weeks ago, we launched an industry first. We took the software of this o Open Daylight Foundation that we're part of, and we're a key contributor to, so a lot of it was our software, right? And we put it out as a distribution, fully supported, because our customers said we want somebody to support this, somebody to integrate with this, and now you can buy the, the, the controller from us. And what the controller does, it allows you to basically plug not only our equipment, but any buzzer equipment beneath it and have a break between the application layer and the infrastructure layer. All right, so people can write applications on the network without knowing anything about the network and on anybody's network. And this is a framework, an open framework to allow that innovation. Very important. So this is what it does. It separates the application from the network layer and offline I can talk to you about all the plugins and the way it works. And it's also a, a full open flow controller built into it as well, as well as a physical controller. We have, I mentioned we have routers, uh, we have virtual components, so we're building virtual, these NFV virtual components, and they're hugely powerful. We can do 80 gig with a virtualized router. This is amazing in terms of throughput, right? So I just wanted to talk very briefly at the end of the presentation about a use case, so I wanted a minute just to explain that, because what does it mean? If, it, if you can't do anything with it, it's useless. Well, here's a network where we've got a, a wide area network. And what we can do with our technology today is we can create an SDN overlay for this network. And I'll explain what that will do in a minute. And we can do that while the, net, while the switches carry on routing in the old way. What, why is that good? Because you don't want this to be a revolution. You want it to be an evolution. You guys, if you have brocade switches, can, out, can let them do conventional routing and in a, in a segment of those switches, not disturbing anything else and completely protected from the rest of the environment, you can mess about and, and try SDN. Not only mess about, but learn in a way that you don't have to buy another infrastructure. So we're, and we're working with the, uh, with the academic community. For example, in Internet2, we're a key provider of the infrastructure. They've picked our devices because we support the SDN and NFV capabilities. They're the best in the industry for that. And we've got the ability in Internet2 to be able to create dynamic networks for them on the fly. Firewalls, routers, dynamic connections for different research projects. They just need it for three hours between very high-speed connections and a whole network with routers and firewalls and everything else. Just for three hours. Can you do it on Wednesday? Yeah, no problem. Plug it in, press the button, done. Now we need it to do something else over in Seattle. Yeah, no problem. Plug it in. They can use that shared resource and reconfigure it in seconds. It's tremendously powerful for that academic community in the US to have a network that can reconfigure, that can be flexible. And just imagine the cost reduction of not having to do buy it and the time to get a research project done. Really important, really powerful. So I kept the time, and I wanted to say I really appreciate the time to speak to you guys. We're outside. We'd love to talk to you about this evolution and what it means for our industry. Thank you.